The reason I think is best illustrated in a story about a medical student who spent his summer vacation working two jobs. During the day, he was a butcher in a large supermarket, and at night, he worked as an orderly in a community hospital. And both of these jobs, you understand, involved wearing a white coat. But one day, when he was on duty at night, he was told to take a woman to the operating room. So he went to her room and he said, Mrs. Johnson, I'm here to take you to surgery. Whereupon the woman turned to her husband and said, Harry, don't let him take me. It's the butcher. <laughs> Mistaken identity can be a real problem. And that's one reason we have this doctrine of the Trinity. You know, Christians, uh, it, it was born out of our attempts to explain the experience of the ordinary Christian who said, where do I find God? Well, God is here, and yet God is everywhere. God is mighty. God is tender. God is yet just, but he's also merciful. He's spirit, yet he takes on flesh. You know, God is spirit, and the spirit blows where it will, and yet the Spirit abides in our hearts. God is one, and yet God is three. As St. Paul wrote to the church in Rome, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. And so this Trinity is nothing less than one of the names by which we identify the, identify the God that we revere. Trinity is the name of the one true God who has revealed himself to us, his Father, his Son, and his Holy Spirit. Now, the main difference between Trinity Sunday and the other Sundays of the year is that today we focus on God's being rather than God's doing, on who God is, rather than what God has done and is doing. Today, then, we turn away from the sacred story to the fact of God, sure, but not so simple. You see, God is too big for our little brains. We can't capture God. We can't contain God. Even so, we Christians have a lot of things to say about God, don't we? For example, we say that God pre-existed chronologically before all of created order, all that we see. God is all-powerful, more powerful than anything else in a created order. God is ubiquitous, omnipresent existing in all places, all at once. And on Trinity Sunday, we pay particular attention to this enigma, that God is simultaneously three persons and one. Not three persons that seem like one, not one person with three aspects. Rather, we acknowledge something that in our minds is physically impossible. Three equals one, and one undivided equals three. Now, tradition has reduced theological statements about God to writing. You can find them in the Book of Common Prayer, for example, in some reform, in the creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian Creed. You say, what's that? Look in the back of the prayer book. The problem with reducing articles of faith, articles of truth to writing, is that we end up confusing what's written with the truth itself. Words are finite. And a truth like God is not. The written word merely reflects some aspect of the truth that's been experienced. 
because writing cannot and does not contain the truth. When we're searching for truth that's contained in written or spoken communication, we always have to remember that experience precedes the communication. In the case of the Trinity, we experience God as triune before writing the word Trinity. The word Father, Son, and Holy Spirit follow the experience of God as Father, as Son, as Holy Spirit. And thus, while these three words express some semblance of the church's experience, they are not the experience itself. And that's simply because no words can contain God fully. God is much larger than ink on a piece of paper. None of the creeds can contain God fully because God is much larger than paragraphs. To paraphrase St. Augustine of Hippo, all the words we write about the Trinity, we write not because we can say something adequately about it, but because in the absence of adequate speech, we must say something. As I implied a moment ago, we shouldn't assume that this concept of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has always been settled in the church. It took centuries to get to the point of actually reducing that concept to three and one and communicating that concept in the creeds. Plus, the church itself actually split because it couldn't agree on elements of this, all this stuff. You know, to this day, the church is split east from west because of a continuing disagreement over one aspect of how we define the Trinity, the Filioque Clause. Does the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and the Son, as the Western Church says, or from the Father alone, as the Eastern Church says. Who's right? The bishop was visiting a congregation for confirmations, and to assure himself that uh, the confirmands were properly prepared, he leaned over the pulpit and he said to a youngster sitting over here, he said, tell me, son, what is the bishop? Or what is the Trinity? <laughs> I didn't understand you. What is the Trinity? <laughs> Speak up, son. Tell me. I didn't understand you. What is the Trinity? And the young lad spoke up in a loud voice, and he says, you're not supposed to understand. It's a mystery. Well, actually, that young lad was right. The Trinity we discover really isn't simply about a doctrine at all. It's about a mystery. And unlike some detective story, a theological mystery isn't something we can figure out if only we have enough clues. In theology, the Greek word from which we get the word mystery is a synonym for the Latin word from which we get the word sacrament. So it isn't something to be solved. It's something to be experienced. It's something that takes us beyond outward appearances into something that's deeper or higher or broader for all three. And a sacrament does this so effectively that it becomes a means to experience that deeper or higher or broader reality. Sacraments open the door to another dimension. And they give us the opportunity to peek through that door, not only to catch a glimpse of what is otherwise an invisible realm, but to actually be a part of it. So Trinity is a description of experience as well as received truth. It's not a scientific description of God. God cannot, after all, 
be contained in the human brain. Trinity is and ever will remain a mystery this side of heaven. So what's the point of it all? In our faith, the point is never to try to figure out God by reading and learning, but simply to experience God. And the pertinent question today is the one that it's always been. Where do I find God? Where do I find this divine love and acceptance and redemption? We humans are finite and contained, substance and mortal bodies. You know, at best, we occupy, let's say, three cubic space, uh, feet of geometric space. And yet we tend to try to expect all the truth of the universe to find a home in our little unique brains. God, on the other hand, is infinite. Recall the words of the psalmist who wrote, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you have set in their courses, what is man that you should be mindful of him? The son of man that you should seek him out. Wonder outside tonight, if the sky is clear, and it looks like it will be, look up. There you're going to see stars and constellations and maybe a meteor or two. The moon and the Mars. And if it was really dark, maybe even a slice of the Milky Way. These are but a few things of the universe that we can actually see. Things that we can experience with our eyes. But what about that part we can't see. The heavens are like God. We look up to the lights of heaven and in them we can see God. But what about all those things out there in that infinite universe that we don't see? Now we know in part. Now we see in part. But the part that we can't see in that dark black sky, beyond those stars, there is God. Hidden, and yet mysteriously present. But in this mystery is the answer to that question, where do I find God? And this mystery is a sacramental encounter with the God we seek, an experience of divine love, and acceptance, and redemption. We experience Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.